I know that actually in this lecture, we have a very heterogeneous background. So probably there are some students that have already a lot of, of uh, experience in the design of digital systems. Maybe there are other students that have a very short background in the design of a single processor. Because of that, in every one of the chapters, I will start with something like a summary about what you should already know. For those that you already have that in the bachelor, it will be just a review. For those of you that didn't have a lecture about microprocessor design, this is just a new stuff that you have to review. The agenda of the lecture can be found here. Basically, what you have is first a motivation. Here, we are going to discuss what is a system on chip. As an example, we are also going to discuss what is a vision system on chip, and then what is a multiprocessor system on chip. The idea is that you get, an, you get some feedback about what are the kinds of system that we can create today and that we should be able to analyze after the end of the lecture. Then we are going to move to the processor microarchitecture. Here we have it. In this, to discuss fundamentally two points. First, the so-called statically scheduled pipelines, and then the dynamically scheduled pipelines. Systems where you define at compilation time the order of the instructions. Nevertheless, in this point, we are going to discuss the typical five stage, <coughs> five stage risk processor. Then we are going to move to dynamically scheduled pipelines. The idea here is to design some processors that have some additional intelligence in such a way that they can change the order of the instructions dynamically. Yeah, we will see that because of the problems of the cache, it's very, very advantage, advantageous if the processor can decide dynamically which are the order of the instructions that he wants to execute. This out of order execution is relatively complex, yeah, but it's increasing a lot the performance of your system. Once we have discussed these two kinds of processor microarchitectures, then we will move to the memory hierarchy. As you know, when you design any digital system, and in principle, when you design a multiprocessor, one of the fundamental questions is how do you want to organize the memory? Probably in your bachelor, you have already discussed a little bit what is a cache, how can we improve the performance of a RISC processor with a cache, and so on and so forth. Here, we are going to do what to go one st a step further. We are going to discuss how can we connect different memories in parallel in such a way that different processors can have a similar view of the memory. Yeah. For that, first, we are going to discuss the so-called coherency between, between different multiprocessors. The problem you will see is just the following. Imagine that you have three processors, everyone has a cache, has a private memory, and then all of them, they are working in the same memory space. If one processor writes in one position of memory, how the others are going to realize that actually this position of memory is, is there, has, got, has been updated? After discussing this fundamental problem, we are going to review the cache architectures. This is the point that I believe for some of you will be a review. Nevertheless, we will discuss it from the very beginning. So how can we organize a cache? Uh, why cache are working so well? Which are the different kinds of cache? And so on and so forth. After this preliminary discussion, we are going to start with the architectures for multiprocessor systems. First, we are going to discuss the so-called snooping protocols. These are the protocols where we have some hardware, which is just checking what happened in the bus. And out of that, he updates all the caches. 
in order to increase the scalability of our system, we are going to discuss as well the so-called directory-based protocols. These are protocols where we have some small part of hardware which is responsible of some of the positions of memory. After the memory, in the next part of the lecture, we are going to move to the interconnect. If we want to develop, if we want to create a multiprocessor system, one of the key questions is how can we interconnect all of these different elements? To discuss this problem, first, I would like to review the different metrics and the different topologies that you may have for interconnecting processors. We are going to discuss what, it, what is a point-to-point -point connection, what is a pass, what is a network on chip, what is the bandwidth, and so on and so forth. After this preliminary discussion, we are going to move to the on-chip buses. Here, we are going to discuss the standard bus that probably you already know. In addition to this standard bus, we are going to discuss the embedded high-performance buses. These are systems, these are architectures, which are especially interesting if you want to develop one embedded system. In order to develop a multiprocessor system, the third step that we are to discuss is the so-called networks on chip. This is something like an internet, yeah, but for connecting the cores that you have in your system on chip. After covering these points, processor, memory, and interconnect, we are going to review again the architectures for multiprocessors. We are going to remind again the taxonomy for the different architectures. We are going to discuss what is a single instruction multiple data architecture, what is a multiple instruction multiple data, and so on and so forth. We are also going to discuss the two fundamental organizations for multiple instruction, multiple data architectures. These are the messaging, the shared memory multiprocessors. Finally, if we have time, I would like to discuss with you which are the tools that you can use today to analyze and to develop a multiprocessor system. One of the fundamental points today is that just as a, let's say, first year master student, you are already able, you are going to be already able to create your own processor. Nothing to learn which are the tools that you could use for that can be very useful, okay? Somehow, these are the slides that I would like uh, to cover. So the agenda that I would like to cover in this lecture. Is everything clear? Sir, I have a question. Can you please go back to the slide number four? Hello? Perfect. Then let's move, let's move to the, the real first, let's say, work. Let me just switch the tool. Okay, so let's start with this introduction about multiprocessor systems. So what we would like to, to understand is how can we create a system like the one shown in this figure. For example, this one that you may see here. This is a so-called vision system on chip. What you have here is actually one system that can take automatically some images and then with a set of parallel processors, something like 1000, can present, process that image, for example, to detect if there is a, 
an error if you have a sign and so on and so forth. Okay. What you may find here, is a dual core system. You will see that in this dual core system, we have two processors, one and two, but inside the processor itself, you can see that what actually we have is a single instruction architecture, a lot of processors, small processors working in parallel. So our agenda for this first introduction is first to try to discuss why today we have so many systems with a lot of parallel elements. And in particular, why we see today a trend to massive parallel architectures. Then we are going to discuss the issues with parallelization, which are the advantages of parallelization, but also which are the issues with parallelization. And in particular, we are going to discuss the so-called Atmals law. This is something like, um, let's say, the big problem of parallelization. In the third point of the lecture, I would like to discuss one classification, one taxonomy of parallel architectures. And in particular, we are going to introduce what is a single instruction multiple data architecture and what is a multiple instruction multiple data architecture. Okay, so let's start with this multimedia element. Here you have two examples of some digital systems. They are already a little bit old, they are maybe five years old, something like that. The first one, here we have it. This is a dual core processor. This was one of the first dual core processors that we were generating at, um, at with a, a 90 nanometer technology. It has two cores and because of that, it, this is one of the system where we have to care about the interplay between the two cores. I took this example because this is one of the first systems where you can have more than one core work together. And you can observe that the technology is a 90 nanometers. So if today you just start to create your master thesis in this direction, you could already create one system with one technology, which is even better than the technology that you required for creating this dual core processor. Also, you can see that in addition to the two processors, one and two, you see here, we have a vector engine. These are these multimedia engines that are used, for example, for voice filtering and so on and so forth. And fundamentally, these engines are working as a set of elements which are working in parallel with the so-called single instruction multiple data. Another example, also in this nanometer technology, 90 nanometers, is this one. This is the so-called cell processor. This is one of the processors that was used for the games consoles. What you can see here is that you have one main processor it was a power processor, something like a standard processor. But in addition to that, you see here, one, two, two three, four, five additional special data elements. I think it's worth it to have a look with a bit more detail just to see which are the kinds of systems that we have Oh, 
Post nine. Post is he disconnected? Jos, my Jos. Hello, hello. Hey, bro. Hey, Jimmy. Hello, JB. Hello. Hello, JB. Hi. Hello, JB. Hello. Let's play PUBG. Hello, JB. Hello. 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 Talking here. Is it working or? Uh, we can't see your slides anymore. Mm -hmm. Hello. 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 What happened? Uh, Alberto, we cannot hear you properly. I can't see anything. Me too. Hello, JB. Hi. Who is JB? Hello. What are you on the plate? So it seems that there is some problem with the connection. I can see the professor. Hello, JB. Hello. Hello. I'm afraid that the session was broken. Yes, there are some discussions. Nevertheless, I see that now most of the students are here. It's back now. 
Yes, sir, we can hear you. Uh, can you please repeat uh, the slide number yeah, three again? Okay. Third slide. Could you please uh, tell me if you can see the slide again? Yes, slide number three. Yes, sir, we can. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Can you also hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Yes. 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 Sir. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, perfect. I would try to repeat. So I'm not sure what's going on, but twice I got, I saw that there was a, a breakdown exactly with when one of the videos of the students were turned it on. Please do not turn on your video. If you do, it seems that the program for some reason is crashing. Yeah. You have, I give you all the rights to turn on video and um, audio, but please do not use it. Okay. So I, I okay. said, I was trying to discuss here the different, uh, let's say, elements that we can observe. And in particular, I wanted you to see that we have an heterogeneous system. Yeah and that we have a set of, let's say, different degrees of parallelism. We have here the different processing elements, which are different. Also, we have inside every element, we have here inside also one single instruction multiple data accelerator. Here in the processor, we have another accelerator and so on and so forth need something to check what was the hardest part when creating this system. Do you know what was the hardest thing? Actually, it was not to create this system. It was not to create this processor. It was not to create this processor, the hardest part was to create what you have here, the interconnect architecture. This interconnect architecture should be able to communicate all the elements in parallel with a very high speed. in this cell processor. So what can we learn? So what can we learn? I repeat it. So Sir, can you repeat it in okay. the interconnect I, processor? It seems that the voice is breaking. Mm -hmm. Sir, we can't hear last two minutes. For example, Max, could you please turn off your microphone? I think now all the microphones are turned off again. I hope now you can hear me properly. Okay. Good. Again, I think we all have to get used to this online video. And because of that, we have to 
follow some rules. Please do not leave the microphone on and don't turn on your video. If no, the, the quality will be very, very bad. What I was saying is that the hardest part for developing this cell processor was also the interconnect architecture. It was not to create the processors, it was actually to generate the interconnect architecture. This means that if we want to create such a system, we have to understand how, to, how can we create a fast processor with parallelism inside. We have to understand how can we create different processors which are working in parallel with a GoLZ protocol. We have to understand how can we create a memory structure with a lot of processes working in parallel. And then third part, we have to learn how to do a powerful interconnect architecture. You see, these are fundamentally the three points that we wanted to discuss in our agenda. Here you see, just with a couple of graphics, the evolution of the multiprocessor systems. You see that you can start with one system like this one, just with two cores, this was in 2006, where you have today is systems that can have not just eight cores, like in your smartphone, you may have something like 526 elements working in parallel. Here you can see it a bit better. This is just the evolution of the processors versus the time. What can we see here? Yes, you see here this exponential increase in the number of processors. In fact, today you can have processor 200, 500 elements working in parallel. Yeah, this is our goal to be able to develop such a system. When you want to develop such a system, there is one fundamental question. The terms of increasing the parallelism of your system. Let's imagine that we want to do one algorithm that has a lot of multiplications, just in a very simple way. You could say, well, I can have one processor, but in these processors, I put inside 1000 multipliers. In a more general way, I can put there inside 1000 different arithmetic logic units working in parallel. This will be the idea of single instruction multiple data. You have one processor, but inside the processor, you have a lot of arithmetic units. The other idea would be no. What I want to have is something like 1000 processors working in parallel and everyone with one multiplier. Yeah. What you can see in this graph is actually the mega operations per second divided by the energy consumption that you have in such a system. If you try to say, yes, I want to develop one element with a lot of different processors, you will be there. The other alternative, I want to have one processor with a lot of internally with a lot of multipliers, with a lot of arithmetic logic units. If you can see, none of this solution is optimal. If you want to maximize the performance versus the energy that you pay, you will see that here you get the best results something around here. Yeah. So if this is our most efficient system, this is the system that we want to develop, you will observe that
what you have is one processor, so you have to read only one instruction, yeah? And this instruction is forward to all of the different elements. And because of that, you amortize the fetch. So you fetch one, you have to pay something for this, yeah? But later on, Let me interrupt one second. There was just one question in um, in internet that was not easy to answer. So someone was asking whether we could record the the lecture. Actually, at the very beginning, I thought it's not a good idea. Actually, what I was planning to do is to record the lecture by myself and maybe to edit it and then to give it to you. But I believe right now, the possibilities of recording the lecture has been canceled. I think we cannot record the lecture. Maybe let's try to do the following. I would try to see if I can record the lecture and I can provide it to you. But I can do this only if you, let's say, promise me that you will not share that record. Okay? So it's not the same to try to do a lecture in, in an interactive way, or if we just try to make a lecture that will be shared over internet and everyone can see. I would not be comfortable with that. Okay. I would try to see if at least I can put some records of the lecture. Okay. I said right now, I believe the university removed the record possibilities, what I believe is the right thing to do. So maybe I can try to record from another computer on my side, just the voice so that you can hear it. Perfect. So let's continue. So I was saying, there was some question about that, that actually in the designs that we want to create, we want to have some kind of parallelism inside the processor. These are the different arithmetic logic units, ALUs, inside the PE, the processor element. But also in our system, we want to have, like here, four processing elements working in parallel, okay? So we need, we want to have parallelism inside the processor and in the system. Somehow these are bad news. We have to learn a lot of things, but at the same time, these are very good news for you. We need an engineer to do that so you can get a good job, let's say. As said, if we analyze this trade-off, you see that we, when you move in this direction, the good thing that you have is that you have to read one instruction and this consumes energy. But with this instruction, you can feed all your processors. Yeah. And if you move in this direction, the key point is that you have a lot of interconnections between your processors. And because of that, you are, let's say, wasting some energy. So in addition of these traditional architectures, I want to show here one slide, but it's not trivial to understand, but I hope it can help you to realize that there is a lot of innovation, which is right now possible in computer architectures. Here, 
what we have is the architecture about one ki new kind of processor called stream architecture. It is not so important exactly how it works. It was proposed by Professor Dali a couple of years ago. What I would like you to see is that when they were developing these architectures, you have here one core, another core, you have a lot of cores which are <laughs> working in parallel. All these cores are connected by a global switch, something like uh, internet to the memories. Yeah. And inside the processor, where you have is again an organization between different small memories interconnect with a cluster switch. So fundamentally, what you have there is something like a parallelism in the system. We have different cores, but also inside the core, we have again a set of parallelism. Okay. This is going to be the key message, the key goal of our lecture. Probably some of you will be asking why to develop a dedicated processor? I mean, it's not just better to go to the shop, we buy one processor, we use it in our system and that's all. Why do we need an engineer developing uh, specialized processors? Here you see the answer. Fundamentally, what we have here is versus the year, yeah, which is the efficiency that we can get. So what is the energy that we have to pay for every operation that we execute in our processor? Yeah. In red here, you can see the typical figure of my standard processor. Let's say what you, the processor that you can buy by Intel or whatever, AMD, whatever. You see that as the years evolve, as we get better technologies, then the amount of energy that you need is less. But at some point, exactly here, yeah, you see that things start to get worse. Actually, the technology was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but somehow we couldn't see any improvement. If we compare what happened not with a standard general purpose processor, but what happened with a dedicated ASIC, yeah, you see that as technology improved, we were decreasing the energy consumption. But again, around that point, you see that the improvement was not so fast. What happened here? What is the problem that we got around that year that someone knows? What would you say? Maybe you can use the chat. Why do you think that here we start to have a problem? Even more, if you re remember the old days, all the processors that you could buy were just single processor. Why now we are using so many multi-core processors? So miniaturization, increasing demand, Actually not. The problem is not the miniaturization. So right now we are working with the smaller and smaller technologies. The problem is, as one of the students said, the power wall, the problem with the energy. Transistors were getting so small that the leakage was actually increasing. The energy consumption was actually increasing. The problem of the new processors is not actually to be just fast. The problem of the new processor is to be fast without burning too much energy. Yeah. So actually, if you just compare this slide, you would say, well, we have an improvement of ASIC bell processor. But on the other side, you could say, well, 
to use a processor is much, much more flexible than to, to use um, ASIC. Yeah. So here is what actually we can gain, but we lose in terms of flexibility. Is there something in between? And actually, yes. As you can see, after the 995, there was a booming in architectures of processor that were especially thought for being effective. These are the so-called embedded processors. For example, the ARM processor, or for example, now the RISC 5 architecture. With these, you get something which is more or less in between the two worlds. It is much more efficient than a general purpose processor, yeah, and it is a bit more flexible than a dedicated ISIC. Today, this is one of the preferred solutions. If you want even to go further, if you want to decrease the energy per operation even further than with an embedded processor, one of the most suitable approaches is to use a single instruction multiple data architecture as we are going to discuss in the lecture. Okay, why do we gain with these architectures? The two key points are parallelism. We have processors which are not so powerful like an old single core processor, but we can put a lot of them. Why do we gain with single instruction multiple data? Because we reduce the, let's say, the overhead, the energy overhead that we have with the control you are going to see that these are, again, two of the key leaf motifs that we are going to use in our lecture. I think you can see this trade-off very, very easily if you just analyze the different architectures that have been developed just for image processing. You know that right now image processing is extremely attractive, for example, for automation with this uh, automotive uh, automation so that the cars can drive alone and so on and so forth. What we are representing here is the performance that you get in image processing applications yeah, versus the flexibility. What you can observe is that you can buy one dedicated, one standard processor, let's say a Spark, Itanium, Pentium, wh whatever, where you have a huge degree of flexibility, but where the performance that you get is actually very, very bad. On the other side, you can develop, here you have it, one dedicated solution, for example, one ASIC for doing MPEG compression of the compression, which is very, very, very efficient, but the flexibility is very low. You can use it just for that. And in between, we have some architectures which are that provide, let's say, a good trade-off between performance and flexibility. The key ideas of these architectures is to use single instruction multiple data or multiple instruction multiple data. Clear? So let's see what have we seen. We have seen that there is a trade-off between flexibility and efficiency. We have seen that the standard processors yeah, the monocore processors that were used in the 90s, they are very power inefficient. And because of that, what we have to do is to try to increase parallelism, to have a lot of small processors, then to reduce the control overhead using the idea of single instruction multiple data, and to reduce the data overhead just doing a distribution of the memory elements, especially of uh, cache and registers. Good? Clear? Everything until now? Any question? Clear? Perfect. Please, if you have any question, just uh, do it.
Hello. So right now, what we try to do is just an introduction. So don't worry, probably there is a lot of concept that maybe you have not seen. What is uh, single instruction, multiple data, multiple instruction, multiple data, what means parallelism, what means there is a lot of concepts that we just mentioned right now, yeah? But we are going to discuss with more detail during the lecture. My goal for today is that it's just that you understand which are the key ideas that we are going to use. Yeah. Later on, for every one of the, let's say, big topics, I'm going to recommend you one book where you can read about that. The bad news is that it's not going to be just a single book. Yeah, actually, for the processor and for the caches, I would recommend you one book. But when we move to interconnect architectures, we will have to use another book. Okay, but don't worry, there will be some literature so that we can just read carefully the slides. You can discuss about the topics, not just the, the, the slides. Yeah. So for me, the, po the important point now is that you realize today, if you want to develop an important system, you have to do parallelism. And you want to do this parallelism inside the processor and outside the processor. Okay. Good. S somehow, right now I was very, very positive. I said, yes, we have a problem. We are going to solve it in this lecture just with parallelism. In the next part of the lecture, actually what I would like to discuss Yeah, is exactly the opposite. Which are the issues with parallelism? Yeah. Imagine that we have one algorithm. I don't know, I have uh, one million numbers and I want to short them. I have one processor. It takes me, let's say 10 minutes. If I have 10 processors, how long should it take? You could say, well, one minute. The, the idea of parallelism is to share the work that we have to do between different processors in such a way that we are faster. Yeah. And actually the problem is that it is not always one minute. Yeah. Things are in fact much more complicated. And this is what the so-called Amdahl's law tries to, let's say, discuss. To try to understand this law, first we need some terminology. First, what is a task? A task is just a logical discrete sanction of computation work. So let's say a piece of work that we can do. Yeah. Then we have a parallel task. This is a task that can be executed in parallel in different processors. Perfect. Then we have two problems. First is communication. From time to time, to do the job, the task have to exchange some data. And they will need some time for that. And second, synchronization. If we have N processors working in parallel, they have to get coordinated. Now you do this, now you do that. And because of that, you need some resources. So parallelism cannot always just reduce the speed of our system in a linear way. To try to discuss this, yeah, we can define the speed up factor, which is just the quotient between the best, the time that it takes for the best serial algorithm, TS, and then the time that it takes to execute the same algorithm, yeah, if you have P processors. So if we go to our example of the shorting, then we see, okay, one processor with the best algorithm take 10 minutes for doing this short. 
Yeah. And then if I put 10 processor, I get 1.5 minutes. So which is the speed up that I get? You just divide these two numbers. You hope that you will get a speed up factor, which is proportional to the number of processors. Here you have one example. We have one task that needs 100 units of time. Yeah. Now we assume that we have four processors. So we hope that everyone will be done in 25 units of time so that we get a perfect parallelization of a factor of four equal to the number of processors that we have. Now, if we assume that there is an overhead because of the exchange of data, synchronization and so on, so that instead of 25 units of time, actually every processor needs 35 units of time, we have let's say, a bottleneck of 10 units of time, then what you observe is that the real speed up is 2.85. So we move from 4, great, to less than 3. Yeah, we are faster, but not as fast as we wanted. And things can be even worse. What happened if we have a difficult problem you cut it in four pieces, yeah? But now, every one of the four pieces is not equal. There are some algorithms, like for example, the coding images that can take a bit more time or a bit less. So you share your work, but it turned out that one of the parts take 13 units of time, the other 20, the other 40, and the other 10. So more or less, all them together are these 100 units, but now, you have not cut in equally parts. In this scenario, what will be the speed up? 100 divided by 40. Yeah, the worst case execution that we have here. So the gain that we have observed is just 2.5. If now in top, of, in top of that, we add the overhead of the synchronization, these 10 units, then instead of 40, we will require 50 units of time. And actually, the overhead or the speed up that we got is just a factor of two. Yeah. So we move from a factor speed up of four to just a speed up of two. Okay. Problems are the synchronization cost and the load imbalance. Hmm. Bad news for the parallelization. It seems that it's not so easy as we thought. In addition to that, there is another problem. Yeah. Here we see, this is just a conceptual graph where we are representing the speed up that we have for different algorithms. It turns out that, that for some algorithms, we get a linear speed up. Yeah. There are also some algorithms where actually we get a super linear speed up. So if you put N processors, what you gain is much more than N. But in most of the cases, what you have is a sublinear speed up. If you increase the number of processors, actually the speed up that you get is smaller than N. And in fact, if you put a lot of processors, you get something, here you have it, which is even worse than here because of the overhead of the synchronization and so forth and so forth. Yeah, so there is some problems with parallelization because of synchronization and load imbalance. Good. So here we have summarized the typical issues with the, um, let, let's say, with the overhead of parallelization. One is interprocessor communication, the other is load imbalance, the other is synchronization, and the final one is extra computation just to divide the work and so on and so forth. Clear? Professor, I have a question. Clear until now? You, uh, professor, I have a question. Can you hear me, Professor? Good. Actually, there is an additional problem. We were assuming that if we have one algorithm, somehow we can cut it in pieces. 
if you want to short one million numbers, you could say, well, I short the first part and the second part and the third part and so on and so forth. And then once they are shorted, I shuffle them. But actually, this is not always the case. Typically, when you have one algorithm, you have one part that you can parallelize and one part like for example, the initialization and so forth, yeah, that you can not. Let's call alpha the fraction of the program that has to be serial. The part of your program that cannot be ser serialized. Yeah. Now, if you think what happened if you add more processors, you will see, okay, for this alpha part, even if I add more processors, I cannot improve the time. I cannot parallelize it. And only for the part one minus alpha, only for the parallel part, I can reduce it just by adding some processors. So ideally, the parallelization that I can get, TP, is alpha plus one minus alpha divided by P multiplied by the execution in the serial case, okay? What you can observe is even if you put an infinite number of processors, you are never going to get a time which is smaller than alpha times Ts. So if now we take this formula, yeah, and we try <coughs> to calculate which is the parallelization that factor that we get, you just divide the two numbers and you do the math, you obtain this formula. Yeah. So if you increase P, the number one minus alpha divided by P gets smaller and smaller. But even if you put an infinite amount of processors, you are never going to get something better than one divided by alpha. Even if this part is zero, because you have a lot of processors, you can never get something better than one divided by alpha. Yeah. And this limit, is actually the so-called Amdahl's law. This is the limit in the maximum speed up that you can get as a function of alpha, the part of your algorithm yeah, that you cannot improve. Here you have it. When we make P, you can see that we can never get better than that. For example, if you just imagine that alpha is 10%, you have one algorithm and 10% of your algorithm cannot be parallelized. Yeah, or you have some overhead because of the synchronization and so on and so forth. You can see that you can never get a speed up which is larger than 10. Yeah, even if you put 200. Okay, I see right now in the in the chat, it seems that I cannot hear you. So if you have any question, maybe you can just type in the in the chat and I can try to answer it. There was any question? Please. So let's move to again to the example of this 14. So here, I hope it's clear. Ideally, if you have 100 and you have four processors, then everyone should take 25 in the best case. Okay. Then here we are assuming that in addition of this 14, yeah. Of this 25, sorry, you have a penalty of 10 just because of the additional work that you have to do to share the word, to synchronization, and so on and so forth. And because of that, your speed up is smaller. Now let's go to the third scenario. So if we have 100, and you divide it ideally between four, 
then you will get 25. Yeah, but actually it can happen that you have different results. In this example, it is just an example. We were assuming that you get these numbers, 30, 20, 40, and 10. This is something like 25 plus minus something. Yeah. What actually you get? It depends on how good you were just dividing your algorithm. Yeah. Um, maybe let, let's try to do one example. Imagine that your problem is to try to, to find the prime numbers that you have between one and one million. Yeah. And then you say, okay, I have to do that. So maybe I have four processors. So the first processor will check the prime numbers between one million, between one and one million divided by four. The other between one million divided by four and one million divided by four two times and so on and so forth. So you divide all the numbers into four regions and every processor, yeah, is checking just one small region. The problem is that when you start to search for the prime numbers, maybe they will be in one region more or less prime numbers than in the other one. So every processor is going to take a different amount of time to do the job. Yeah. And this is something that you cannot know in advance. So when you are, uh, let's say, dispatching the the problem, when you are cutting the problem in four pieces, you have to do one assumption. In this case, I have a range. I cut the range in four pieces. But with this, you cannot guarantee how much time will every processor require to finish the task in advance. Yeah. In this example, I'm assuming as an example that one processor requires 30 units of time, the other 20, the other 40, and the other 10. Yeah, the sum is again 100. But the problem is that your algorithm is only done until the four processors are done. So you have to wait until this guy with 40 units of time is done. Okay. So the fact that there is an unbalance in the complexity of the algorithm is making the life of your parallel algorithm harder and harder. Good. It's clear now. So I summarize, here we have the problem overhead. Here we have the problem load imbalance. Here we have the problem load imbalance plus overhead. And finally here, we have the problem of alpha. Not all my algorithm is parallelizable. Another question here, there is some question regarding this super linear speed up. So actually, theoretically, it can happen that you have some super linear speed up. Yeah. But actually there are some algorithms that when you execute them in parallel, they are faster that if you execute them in serial. So it can happen. And there are some very, very rare examples where actually you can do that. But this is just the minority of cases. This happened maybe once every, I don't know. This is very, very rare to have one algorithm with the parallel version is super linear. But theoretically it can happen, yeah? So, yeah. Another question, and this is much more fundamental here, where these 50 are coming from? Uh, again, 
Let me clear this. So I have one algorithm that when executed, let's say in a serial way, it takes 100 units of time. Then I can cut it in pieces to execute it in a parallel processor. But if I do that, just because of the fact that I have to cut it, I have to distribute the work and so on and so forth, I have a penalty of 10. When I cut this algorithm in four pieces, ideally, every processor should take 25 units of time. But if I am unlucky, because I don't know how long will it take, it can happen that I have one guy that requires 40 units of time. Then overall, here, you have to wait your 40 units of time. And then on top of that, you have to add the 10 units of time because of the overhead. This means that to finish your algorithm, you have to wait 50 units of time. 40 until the processors are done in the worst case, plus 10 because of the overhead. Yeah. Reality is much, much harder than the ideal parallelization where you were saying just 25. Okay, I think this is the, exactly the key word. The time is the worst processing time plus the penalty time. Good. Um, I think maybe we can continue a little bit. Maybe it's a good idea just to discuss the taxonomy of processors, but maybe at that time, it would be a good idea to, to stop. I believe that today, internet is not working very well. So probably, hopefully next week, it will be a bit better. Yeah. What's actually data? I have been talking about multiple instruction, multiple data. What is actually that? Yeah. Good. I repeat it. I just want to cover one more slide about the meaning of single instruction, multiple data, and multiple instruction, multiple data. Yeah. Just these two slides. Um, I see that again by mistake, some students are turning on the, um, the microphone. Maybe one solution will be just to, to force to have all the microphones off and then to try to do all the questions with the chat. Somehow this is not so interactive, but maybe this will work better because just if by mistake, some of you turn the microphone on, then the voice is uh, gone for all of you. Okay, then for the next setup, I, I will try to do that. And then just please do the questions with, uh, with the chat. Then let's continue. As I said, my next goal was try to understand what is this with uh, single instruction, multiple data, multiple instruction, multiple data. What, what is that? Actually, before I move to that, there is another question. If this 
a penalty is constant? Actually not. You may have some examples where you have a relatively constant penalty, but you may have another example where it is not the case. Typically the overhead, because of the synchronization, this small rate fix. The overhead, because of the initialization, it's also relatively fixed. But if for completing the job, the different processors have to exchange some messages, then the overhead will be proportional to the amount of data that they have to exchange. And this may change dynamically. Yeah. This means that it's very, very hard to know in reality how will be the penalty that you are going to have. Because of that, it is quite common to do some simulations in your platform to see how it scales with different algorithms. And in particular, this is fundamental when we have one problem where we have to move a lot of data, where we are using a network on chip, of we have uh, a lot of invalidate in our cache and so on and so forth. Exactly because of that, I was planning if we have the time in the last part of the lecture, just to discuss fast, which are the tools, which are the simulation tools that you can use to analyze the scalability and the performance of your multi-core systems. For example, Gen5 and so on and so forth. Good. Any other question? Perfect. Mm -hmm. As I said, it is really possible to get for some algorithms super linear speed up. Yeah. But it is very, very rare. It depends on the algorithm, not on the architecture. Good. So if there is no further question, then let's move to this flying Johnson classification. The point is the following. If you think from the abstract point of view, how a processor is working, you will see that this guy is using two flows of information. He has some flow of information, which are the instructions to be executed. And it has another flow of information, which is actually the, <coughs> which is actually the data, okay? So if you have these two flow of information, you can imagine that they are single or multiple. And because of that, you have the following classification. You can see You, you can see it's very hard to concentrate reading at the same time the, the chat and reading that someone is sleeping. But for two things, come on, he's sleeping at 11. And second, if you can hear it, this means that the microphone was on. I think now all the microphones should be off. I believe now all the microphones are off and no one will be allowed to turn it on anymore. Somehow it's bad that this has to happen, but okay.
Okay. Good. So now should be off. So last slide for today. So I said, you can consider that the processor has to work with instructions and with data. And you can say, if I consider the instructions, yeah, these instructions, sorry, here we have it. These instructions can be single or multiple. And then in terms of data, you can have, again, single or multiple. And because of that, you have four regions. Here, you have the single instruction, single data processor. This means that you have one processor, which is reading one stream of instructions and working with one stream of data. This is the normal processor that you should already know. Then here, we have single instruction, multiple data. What means that? Somehow our hardware is reading one instruction, but applying this instruction to a lot of streams of data. This is the architecture where we have one processor and inside the processor, we have a lot of multipliers working in parallel or a lot of arithmetic units working in parallel. We get the instruction do an addition, but all the arithmetic units are doing this addition with different data. Single instruction, but multiple data. Then here, we get something very, very strange. Multiple instructions, single data. Theoretically, this means that your hardware architecture can read more than one instruction at the same time, but he will apply all these instructions to a single value of data. This is something that has been used for some encryption and decryption algorithms, these architectures, but this is something very, very rare that it's almost never used. Yeah. And finally, you have the idea, multiple instructions, multiple data. This means you have some hardware modules which are reading different instructions and they are applying these instructions to different set of data. What is that? Well, you just have different processors working together. Every processor is reading one instruction and executing this instruction in Sinhaun data. So when you see it from the Astra point of view, the complete hardware is reading a lot of instructions simultaneously and applying these instructions to a lot of data. Then we have the normal processor, the single instruction multiple data, and the multiple instruction multiple data. Okay? I hope you can fit this with this figure. Here we have conceptually something similar to single instruction, multiple data, yeah? And when you consider this architecture, you have multiple instruction, multiple data, okay? If we now analyze with a bit more detail this case of multiple instruction, multiple data, you will see that inside you can consider what happened with the memory and with the communication. Or in other ways, what happened with the physical distribution of the memory and what happened with the logical view of the memory, how the people see the memory. If you consider the blocks of memory, you can say that they are global, you have a piece of memory altogether, or the memory is distributed. You have a lot of small blocks of memory distributed all over your architecture. And then from the logical point of view, it can happen that all the processors believe that they have a big, big memory of 
a big, big address of memory. So all the processor can access all the data that you have. Then we are saying that we have a shared memory architecture. Or you can say, no, every processor yeah, is only able to access some part of the memory. And if he needs some other part of the memory, he should send one message to the other processors, which are respons responsible for that part of memory. This will be the message passing. And because of that, here inside, we will discuss in the next part of the lecture that actually we can classify this into four parts. Okay? So for today, the only thing that is important for me, we are going to discuss that with a much, much more detail, is that you realize that we can organize our architecture in, let's say, four classes, single instruction, single data, single instruction, multiple data, and here, multiple instruction, multiple data. This is almost never used. And for the particular case for the multiple instruction, multiple data, it seems that we can subclassify that in different sub-architectures, okay? Clear this idea? Since today it seems that the internet is not working very well, I think it will be a good idea if we just close for today. Okay. I see there's, there was one additional question regarding to the books. Again, about the books, they are going to change with every lecture. So if you download the lectures, for example, when we check, it will be next week. The processor architecture, then at that point, I will recommend you some bibliography. When we move, for example, to the other part of the lecture, let's say, dynamic share architectures, then here you will get another book. For example, this will be in two weeks. This is the book that we are going to use for the multiprocessor architecture and the cache. Okay. Another question is related with the multiple instruction, multiple data. I said, this is something that you can very, very easily find almost in any book, yeah? Right now, I just wanted to use to get the, the idea that we can add parallelism in terms of instructions or in terms of data, yeah? But we are going to discuss this architecture with a much more detail. Then what about single instruction, multiple data? So actually there is a lot of uh, possibilities. So if you check a modern processor, yeah, you will see that very often they have something like an accelerator so that you can try to do some things much faster. For example, image processing, audio processing and so on and so forth. The guy doing this acceleration is actually a single instruction multiple data accelerator. Yeah, so in a general purpose processor, very often you have a core, which is a single instruction multiple data. But also this single instruction multiple data is one kind of architecture, which is very, very commonly used for an ASIC. For example, in the past, I was working with vision system on chip so processor that were just specialized in vision processing. And for that, it's very common to use a single instruction multiple data architecture. I see another comment, five minute break in the middle of the class. I think it's a great idea.
if I forget it, please remind me next time. And I believe we have to cut the lecture into parts with a five minute break. If no, it's going to be very hard for you really to follow it. Good. I believe the syllabus, so just the, the big topics, this should be one of the slides that we already have. I didn't put it with more detail because actually in every lecture, we have just an expansion of this key syllabus. If it is not in a stud IP, then I will upload this slide as well. But I believe this pseudo concept should be the syllabus that we discussed at the very beginning. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Maybe what we can do next time is at the very beginning, when I ask you if the, everything is working, maybe you can just try to answer using the, the chat, just to make sure that everything is working. And if at some point there is any issue, just write it in the chat so that I can stop and go back. I think the chat, the chat is the best, yes. Okay. Then, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Sorry that this semester we have to do it in this online way that I know it's much harder for you, but let's try to do the best of that. So thank you very much. See you next week.